Um, thank you all for coming on a rainy, rainy Thursday. Mm -hmm. at the day, right? I have a two and a half year old, so I don't know where I am half the time. Um, okay, so building on to that, what I'm going to do for you today is hopefully give you a bit of knowledge about the British Black Power Movement, about the Black Power Movement in Britain, and we'll try and contextualize that. And it really feeds well because looking at the the way that the two days are going to span out, this is a kind of start of something which gets taken on and gets built upon as we go through the, the mid-60s up until the present. Right? So the title of the talk is Oppressed People Are On The Move, The Global Politics Of British Black Power. <coughs> okay, so we'll start with some anecdotal questions. Where's this? Yeah? Where's this? You didn't think it was going to be a geography lesson, did you? <laughs> it's Birmingham, Alabama. All right, so let's start with a little anecdote. In 2008, this Birmingham City Council got in trouble because it redesigned its website and instead of putting this skyline on, put this skyline on. <laughs> right? <laughs> And the way I bring that up is, is that this isn't the first two times that the two Birminghams have been conflated. In 1965, when Malcolm X visits, visits Smevik, many prominent Labour and Conservative MPs comment that Malcolm shouldn't be coming here because Birmingham Smevik isn't like Birmingham, Alabama. Although, at the midpoint of the 60s, you would have heard reports in Leamington Spa, Birmingham and other places across the UK of crosses burning on the lawns of black residents. If I had more time, I'd show you this lovely VT about that, but we don't have enough time. I can share the link later. But there was a spate of this, and there were rumors that the KKK had actually started its own organization in Britain, right? And was going around, and there was going to be race war. Now, as you know, the history of British fascism doesn't need it. American versions of the KKK to, to express itself. These, these myths were kind of proven to be myths. They were, there was no KKK, but there certainly was a concerted racist aggression towards non-white people in Britain at the midpoint of the 60s onwards. And this is kind of the context of which black power emerges. Okay, so what I'm going to do in this lecture is to kind of bring to the fore what is black power, what is British black power, and then I'm going to focus specifically on the kind of global politics of this movement. I'm not so much interested in all of the historical details, but rather from what we can learn about that form of politics. And then we'll try and drag it back into the present for you guys so we can, we can link the past with the present. So black power is often seen as originating from Stokely Carmichael's famous call for black power in 1966. This was the kind of emergence of a critique of the civil rights movements in the US, and black power was seen as the kind of pushing forwards of the civil rights movement beyond the Voting Rights Act. So whereas the Voting Rights Act in 1965 had, had given African Americans formal equality with their white peers, it hadn't established social and political and economic justice for African Americans. African Americans were still poor, they were still subjugated, and discrimination became far more insidious, if not kind of far more kind of powerful because it was now informal, right? And we see this normally, black power and the relationship between it, between black power and the civil rights movement through these two iconic figures. So Martin Luther King being the expression of a civil rights movement based around peaceful protest, around integration, and Malcolm X being the kind of opposite of this, being a segregationist, being an advocate of violence. We know that these binaries aren't true. In fact, by the End of his life in 68, I would say Martin Luther King was far closer to Malcolm than people want to remember. Right? Very radical. But black power in the UK also has its own distinct history. So, and of course there are other famous US black power groups that you've probably heard about called the UK, from the Black Panther Party. Right? So that's Bobby Seale and Huey Newton. And the kind of politics that black power puts forward is a kind of radical global politics in the US, linking the struggles of African Americans with the imperialist wars in Vietnam and other places across the third world. This is Huey Newton meeting the Premier of China in 1971. 
This is Huey Newton meeting Yasser Arafat. So we see a kind of global politics, black power linking struggles in the domestic context of the US with the third world. And of course, we all know these iconic figures. Who is this? Angela Davis. Now I'm in London, so you don't let me down on the next slide, all right? Because if you do, because when I go up north, no one knows who this is. Who's that? Olive Morris, right? See, I came to London. I knew I was going to get you. Because I go over places and be like, huh? So Olive Morris, in many ways, if you don't know the story of Olive Morris, Olive Morris please Google. Um, she was born in 1952 in Jamaica. She comes here. She's a radical organizer. She's actually arrested at 16 stroke 17 for getting in an altercation with a policeman after she defends a kind of Nigerian diplomat who was being uh, harassed because he had diplomatic plates, but the police still wanted to do him for parking irregularities. She dies in 1979 at the age of 27. And I always put her up to next to Angela Davis because having read her archive and have read some of her writings and delved into her historical activism, she in many ways was our Angela Davis. She was just robbed of the future of that kind of academic and political celebrity in a kind of inverted brackets. Right? And with that's that history we want to talk about. I think Livia's kind of idea that we orient ourselves to the US kind of detracts from our own history of race and resistance, which in Britain is very, very uh, powerful. And the archive is full, if not the archives are shutting down across London all the time, right? unfortunately. So if you can support New Beacon Books, support George Padmore, go to the Bri Brixton Black Cultural Archives. We need to support and keep these places alive, because if they don't, the history will die. OK, so the UK has its own distinct history of black power, and it pivots around three kind of main things. One is, of course, new Commonwealth immigration and settlement from Africa, Asia, and of course, the Caribbean. Many of us in the room probably have those coordinates of our trajectories into Britain. Having a guess, looking at the composition of the room. Of course, the racial discrimination, which, which started transpiring as new Commonwealth immigration happened in the 1960s. So the Immigration Acts of 62, of 68, and 71, which looked to, to curb what was called coloured migration. Racist, uh, racist practices in employment, so colour bars, of course, education, housing, and that good oldie police brutality. And of course, by 1968, we have the emergence of Enoch Powell's famous speech, Rivers of Blood speech, which is actually given in Birmingham and the emergence of what we could call Powellism, which we'll return to a bit later. The idea that we as non-white citizens in Britain are, in, in a sense, second-class citizens and shouldn't really be here. And so UK black power is informed by US black power, but as I'm going to try and argue, it has a distinct take on things, but also more maybe even more importantly than the US conceptions, it's informed by anti-colonial activism and discourse in the third world. So the emergence of what Vijay Prasad calls a third world project, the idea that national liberation movements spanning from India to China to various nation states across Africa essentially try to challenge the West's dominance in the global economy and of course in, in the kind of global nature of global politics. And so we can date black power in the UK, ironically before, and I kind of make this point, you can actually date black power in the UK actually before it starts in the US. So if Stokely Carmichael's call in 66 is for black power, right? When Malcolm X visits Britain in 1965, he meets someone called, and who you might know, called Michael X, right? Now, if you meet older activists, they'll always tell you Michael X was a charlatan and didn't really believe in these radical politics. But essentially, uh, Michael X creates a, an organization uh, called the Racial Adjustment Action Society. And the reason it was called that is because it spells out RAS. Yeah? <laughs> and he thought it'd be quite funny to get white media elites to say RAS all the time. <laughs> I don't need to explain what RAS means to you guys, right? So, and actually what we see is this, this emerges in 1965 after the emergence of the Race Relations Act in Britain and the failure of that Race Relations Act in Britain to actually get us economic and political justice. So in a sense, there's a kind of parallel to the, not failure, but limitations of the civil rights movement in the US and our own failures and limitations of our own kind of rate move for kind of racial civil rights in Britain from 65 onwards. So you can actually make the argument that black power in Britain predates black power in the US. That normally pees people off when I say that, but 
there is a, there is an argument to be made there. In 1967, Stokely Carmichael visits the UK and gives a very famous speech at the Dialectics of Liberation Conference, which happens, I think, at the LSE. And this, this is often seen as the kind of, these two, two events are seen as the emergence of black power in the UK. I would tend to say the, the establishment of RAS is the start of British black power. And then you get the proliferation of different groups as people fall out with one another. As any of you know who do activism, you know that groups always fall out with, your, with each other and create other groups, right? And so you get a proliferation of groups. So the first kind of group that follows the kind of limited successes of RAS is something called the United Colored People's Association, which starts in 1967. The Black Unity and Freedom Party, which starts in 1970. The Black Panther Movement, right? So we have our own, Olive Morris was part of the Black Panther Movement, which starts in 68 and goes to 73. And around 72, it renames itself the Black Workers Movement. We'll get onto that, why it does that. And the Black Liberation Front, which, which roughly starts in 1971. And you have other affiliated groups. The Black Eagles, which was a group primarily run by Darkus Howe, who eventually joins the Black uh, Panther Movement. The Bricks and Black Women's Group, which would come a bit later. The Indian Workers Association, which, was a, which is an organization that predates all of these black power groups, but had relationships with them. So in the archive in Birmingham, Joshi, the head of the Birmingham IWA, has letters flowing back and forth with black power groups about forming solidarity and debates about who is and who isn't black, which we'll get onto, right? Which is an interesting one. And of course, the Institute of Race Relations, which still goes on today, headed up, or was headed up by the legendary Sivan Anden. So we have a grouping of very radical activists all pushing forwards together around this idea of black power. But what does that mean? Well, as I kind of hinted at, you have a a kind of eclectic mix of pan-Africanism, anti-colonial politics, Marxism, versions of black nationalism, soft, often within these groups at the same time, all pushing together to try and get more kind of room for their position. They're, in, they're national organisations, so part of the history of British black power, the archive is very London-centric, but groups like the United Coloured People's Association had branches in Manchester. I found archival documents in places like Huddersfield, it wasn't just a London-centric movement. And of course, Birmingham, the, the city that, where I live, was also a pivotal kind of place where these, some of these politics were taking place. And in many ways, British black power replicated elements of its US counterpart quite well. So black is beautiful. So looking at kind of black history and image and culture and, and rejuvenating them. Black self-determination, so the idea of we can create our own schools, we can do things better, we can create different forms of housing. And of course, black self-defense from police brutality and from racist terrorism. And we, we, we have to be, you know, the correct terminologies for, for what was happening in the 60s and 70s is essentially terrorism. Non-white communities, new Commonwealth communities were essentially terrorized by fascist thugs in various ways. And this linked black power to the community. Again, British black power had very similar... Um, ideas to its US counterpart about global politics. Its argument was that British left-wing politics at the time in the 60s and 70s had more in common with the ruling classes in Britain than actually the liberation of people across the globe. The argument was that actually British socialism just wanted to have good industry here, good jobs here, good jobs for white people, but essentially didn't care about its non-white citizens both within Britain, within the remnants of the empire, but also those outside of the British Empire as well. So it's a very radical critique of race and class, and we'll come back to that, because we have seemingly gone back to this idea that all we need to do is make the world good over here. And there was a radical idea that anti-racism here had to be linked to global struggle abroad. If it wasn't, it was useless. Right? And of course, at this moment, as I've kind of said to you, the third world project, the, third, the idea that we could liberate all of us, was happening. This in many ways pitches this story of British black power and its global politics, tells us that when idiots like Michael Gove tried to argue that we needed to have an island history of Britain, that that in itself was impossible. Right? British black power understood that the history of Britain largely took place outside of these islands, and then as we returned, we needed to make 
these islands aware of their links and their responsibilities to those outside of Britain itself. And many people narrate this as a kind of, in Britain we have this kind of you know, trajectory, we go from an anti-racist struggle from the 60s, 70s, and then we have multi, multiculturalism in the 80s and everything goes bad. But actually the key bit to all of this is that our anti-racist struggle was about a global struggle. It wasn't just about, as I'll get onto later, us going to Oxford and Cambridge. All right? Not that that's a bad thing. That's a good thing. But we'll get back to that. All right, so I'm going to narrate things that make British black power distinctive. And I'm going to do two things. I'm going to look at its idea of political blackness, which has become a kind of derisory term now. I'm going to look at its ideas of anti-imperialism. And then I'm going to look at its problematization of what we call the white working class. All right? So this is actually Stokely Carmichael on his visit to, to Britain. Um, he says, I wasn't surprised to see militant Afro-Caribbean Afro youth embracing the core. These youth were second generation and weren't about to accept the condensation and abuse their parents had endured. endured. No surprise there. What did surprise me was to hear black power resonating and to see raised fists in the Asian communities, especially amongst Pakistani youth. And so coming to Britain, and people have debated actually whether Carmichael was right to see this in the crowd. right? But Carmichael notes something that makes British black power very distinctive to its US counterparts in the sense that the political identity put forward by British black power groups lumped all of new Commonwealth, immigra new, new Commonwealth immigrant communities under the banner of being black or politically black, right? And so what happened was you sat underneath this term of being black and then you came from your various communities. So you were either Indian or Pakistani or you were from, the, you were from Jamaican, you were from Trinidad, and then you all sat underneath this as non-white people. Right? So if you go and read the documents, you'll often see um, people talking about black brothers and sisters, and then in the same breath, expanding this concept to what we take that to be today, to include everyone who's literally non-white in Britain. And this is the era that Sivan Andan famously says, where black was not the color of our skin, but the, but the color of our politics. Right? And actually what drives this are a number of things. One is the previous kind of narration of what I call state racism, so that kind of stopping non-white people coming here. Of course, racist economics. So most of us who came here in the 60s, regardless of our class trajectory from where we previously were, so whether you came from India, whether you came from Jamaica, you could have been middle class, you could have been working class. As soon as you came to Britain, over 70% of all new Commonwealth migrants were turned into the working class. Right, so I always give this anecdotal thing. My, great, uh, my grandfather was a bank clerk. So he was like petty bourgeois. But when he came here, he couldn't get a job in a bank. They wouldn't give an uh, Asian man from Fiji a, a role in the bank. So he had to go to Goodyear's, right, which is, was a tire factory, and had to sweep the floors for like 20 years. Right? And that happened to lots of people. And this was discrimination. We weren't allowed to join unions. Our... Our people weren't, where well, they were informal collar bars, where they wouldn't hire non-white people. And of course, following all of that was racist violence. And UK black power, and I'm trying to work on, I'm finishing a paper at the moment, I'm kind of contending maybe it originates political blackness, I'm not, I'm not particularly sure. But essentially adopts this adage, and ru it runs through nearly all of the groups. Even the groups that are, are the most Afrocentric still hold this concept. It's a bit weird, half the time. But this is the first kind of real statement of black power in Britain from the United Coloured People's Association. This is published in 69, if I remember rightly. And it talks about brothers and sisters from Asia, Africa, the Caribbean, and the Americas. It's replicated in, in the British Black Panther movement, in the Black Unity and Freedom Party, even the more, what I would say, more Afrocentric Black Liberation Front. Ethnicities, in this sense, aren't denied. One of the common criticisms of this is that ethnicities are kind of got rid of. And it's an aim to create solidarity around shared issues and specific communal issues. And so this gives black power in Britain, why I always call it, it gives black power here its British accent. This is what makes black power in Britain much, much different to its US versions, and also, ironically, somewhat similar to its Caribbean evocations. So if you ever read Walter Rodney and the kind of movements, the black power movement that's happening in Trinidad at the time, you'll see that they also are trying to create unity 
between those from the African diaspora and those from South Asian, from the South Asian diaspora via this term of, of black. It's quite an interesting link. And it, and it means that British black power has more maybe in common with its commonwealth, with the idea of commonwealth, than it does the US version. And what you see here are different forms of uh, expressions of what, how those communities are dealing with things. So um, for the Caribbean community, the, the black power movement normally mobilized against police brutality. For the, for the Asian community, this normally came against more kind of forms of racial violence. So um, Paki bashing was a big thing in the 70s. It probably still would be a big thing today if we didn't fight back. Um, campaigns against color bars and work and campaigns against immigration control. So what you can see, that they, they, they took different community struggles and created forms of solidarity around this. And you'll see this in some of the documentation. So this is one of the uh, amalgamations of Black Panther movement uh, newsletters. This is a Black Panther march in London. So does anyone know who that guy is there? Right? And he studied, was studying at SOAS. He joined the British Black Panther movement. He's now quite old, but he's one of the highest ranking members of the Indian Communist Party in India. I have a friend called Vijay Prasad who, this is his comrade. And it shows you the transnational flows of how this political blackness brought people into the struggle. You'll see it again here in this Black Panther newsletter. You'll see the typing. This is a big protest in 1971 against immigration. And you'll see that it also has South Asian script in the title. And forms of solidarity really emerged. So although black power movements were normally uh, consisted of uh, people from the Caribbean, specifically people from, Trin from a kind of Trinidad destination, um, the forms of solidarity emerged around stopping certain forms of discrimination for various communities that sat underneath this idea of political blackness. So this is an ex-British Black Panther talking about going on patrol in South Asian neighborhoods in the East End to deal with the, the problem of Paki bashing. And he says it was about getting justice with the police. The police were more racist than people on the street. If you had people beat, who did you call? Paki bashing or whatever, black bashing, you couldn't go to the police. We would dress in pamphlet gear and go around and patrol the street. Now, I find that quite funny that you all get dressed up like superheroes and go and patrol the street. But in a sense, it shows you the radical forms of solidarity being extended to all forms of people that sat under this umbrella term. And of course, though, this had its own problems. Political blackness was not organic. It often ran into trouble of people saying, South Asian communities saying, we are not black. Um, the Caribbean community also would say South Asians aren't black, and then there would be a debate between Africans and Caribbeans about who was the blackest, right? <laughs> so there was, in a sense, always a, a kind of weird um, instability to this thing. And the problem with this is, is that as we've, what we tend to think about today, and we'll try and talk about this a bit later, solidarity in Britain is, is not organic. We have to work at it. This led to various things. The Black Panthers changed their name to the Black Workers Movement to try and attract more Asian members. We have these real bad overhangs of colonial divisions between the coolie and the slave. So we have you know, people getting into arguments about who is the most oppressed. And of course, the Kenyan and Ugandan crises of, of the late 60s and early 70s would test the litmus of this idea of political blackness. So in the Black Panther Movement, you see this kind of weird, they change position a number of times about Idi Amin. At one point, they're like, yeah, Idi Amin's right. Get rid of the Asian bourgeois. And then they're like, uh, no, no, he's a dictator. We need, to, we need to not do that, right? But what seemed to knit all of this, these people together was not essentially these national issues, but rather a global, global form of anti-imperialism. All right, so I'm trying to see how long I've got left. This is the first meeting of the non-aligned movement, yeah? I, I normally ask people to name these people, but it's actually written here underneath and people cheat. Um, this is Nehru, the first Prime Minister of India. That's Kwame Nkrumah, the first free leader of Ghana. General Nasser, leader of Egypt. Sukarno, leader of Indonesia. And General Tito, who was the kind of quasi-dictator of Yugoslavia. This uh, meeting uh, 
in the year 1961 was the first movement of third world nations which basically put forward the idea of being non-aligned into the debate about who, where did you sit in the Cold War? Were you for the capitalist West or were you for the communist East? And essentially put forward a third way about how we could do politics. Probably finds its best expression in, in the latter chapters of Fanon's Wretched of the Earth. And it basically put forward this idea that we need to recalibrate the global economy to create bread for people. I'm not going to get too much into this. For peace, to get rid of this idea of nuclear warfare. And of course, justice for the, for the people who had, who had been exploited, exterminated, and largely now were subservient to global capitalism. And this, in many ways, is the global context of both US and British black power that we seemingly often forget about in, in what we're talking about. And you see this in, in um, interviews with ex-Panthers. And they say, we were demonstrating about Angola, Ethiopia, Vietnam, you know, all the independent struggles and the links with the workers in the Caribbean, in Guyana, Trinidad. I mean, all of that was very much part of the international perspective. So this centers this black power movement's anti-racist struggles here with wider struggles beyond itself. I'm not going to get all into this. What, what I just want to bring to the front is what this shows us is that anti-racism in its kind of start of its initiation in Britain was in itself linked to global coordinates. So we needed anti-racism at home, but it had to be linked to anti-imperialism abroad. Because remember, most of the people who came in the late 50s and 60s, although they were British, often saw themselves originating from parts of the third world. Right? You could do that dual stuff. We would not pass Norman Tebbit's cricket test. Right? You all know when you go to the cricket, people for the Caribbean support, the West Indies. <laughs> and we all just like to watch England lose. <laughs> I tried to explain this to an American friend once about, this is cricket is just about watching England lose. <laughs> right? And what this did was, is really brilliantly cut across the color line. So what you find is these groups were able to not just say, all white people are devils. It was, it was very subtle and sophisticated at, at narrating the kind of politics of the 60s and 70s. So you'd often find criticisms of Haile Selassie's rule in Ethiopia running through a lot of the magazines. You would see a big denouncement of Eric Williams in Trinidad. So if you all know Eric Williams wrote that famous book, Capitalism and Slavery, then became the, the leader of Trinidad, lost his mind a bit, turned into a bit of a dictator. They would denounce him. They would denounce anyone who didn't push forward an idea of liberation. And it was this idea that we needed to create global consciousness and solidarity. And you see this in much of the literature. This is a national conference held in 1971, largely put forward by the... Black Panther movement, but other radical groups at the time. If you notice the iconography, so it's talking about towards black unity on the rights of black people in Britain, but you'll notice the iconography is very much that we are part of the third world. And again, you would see this on um, various Black Panther movement literature. In fact, the Black Panther movement had a bookstore in Finsbury Park which had this sign on it uh, outside. It's quite an impressive structure. And the literature would always bring forward the idea that struggles here were linked to international news abroad. So very clever. They're very clever at how they pitch things. So you'd have this international news, and then you'd have stuff like stop the racist immigration bill here, right? showing their readers how you link the, what was the national local struggle with the global struggle. And of course, pivoting our struggles with other struggles across the third world. So apartheid South Africa, Palestine, and of course the Caribbean. And they were very hopeful. See, so look, oppressed people are on the move at the bottom here. The days of international capitalism are numbered. How wrong they were. Huh? <laughs> but maybe, maybe the days of international capitalism are still numbered. I hope so, but I'm a bit of a fool. <laughs> and of course, you know, linking these struggles again, this was when Amir Cabral, the, the kind of freedom fighter of Guinea-Bissau, died. Linking with struggles in Mozambique, so you'll hear the Free Limo, the Black Panthers of Israel, which are always a very interesting organization to read upon. And of course, with uh, Aborigine activism in, in Australia. 
This is Bobby Sykes, who was a very famous activist who various black power groups flew over to the U UK to talk to, to groups about, about the struggle of Aboriginal people and indigenous rights in Australia. And of course, doing events which tried to bring this uh, stuff to the people. So I always think I missed out here going to CLR James and John LaRose. These were kind of things you could do in the, in the early 70s. And of course, that US link, this is, if I remember rightly, she is, yeah, she's the mother of, of, of Drongo, one of the Soldat brothers, the most famous of that being George Jackson, the panther, who wrote those wonderful two texts whilst in prison. How long have I got left? Are you guys just making this up? Three minutes. Okay. We'll take five. Um, <laughs> and they also dealt with this idea of the white working class, right? Because at the, the, in the sixties, the big thing were that new Commonwealth migrants had come and displaced the white established communities here. We were workers. We were taking their jobs, and we were leading to their ruin. Does that all sound familiar? Sound very familiar, right? And they would say stuff like this. They would say, well, actually, the workers here have gone mad because they just want to have good jobs here. And they're not really kind of socialist movements towards the liberation of all workers. They've become part of the system. And that the white working class had been duped by elites. And in fact, they make arguments in, in their newspapers, British Black Power Groups, that the white working class is actually an invention of the elites. Right? It doesn't really exist because the working class is multiracial. And you see it time and time again. And they do this wonderful thing. So they re-theorize for us race and class. And what they say is, is this. Yeah, we all want to see capitalism. But as ethnic minorities, we have a double contradiction. We not only have a contradiction with the kind of ruling class, but we also have a contradiction with the racism of our fellow workers. And we need to deal with these things together before we can even get to the first bit of overthrowing the ruling class. Right? So racism was a contradiction between people and class relationships was a relationship between rulers. And what the British Black Power groups wanted to do was to kind of create a self-organization that could be a radical force that could push on with or, or without their white counterparts. And they would regularly challenge their white counterparts to think beyond class relationships here, to think with third world workers and make links with them to critique trade unionism here and the Labour Party's inherent racism. And the anti-racist struggle here, our struggle here, was partly, primarily driven by this need to globalise this idea of class struggle. Right? All of this would sound very familiar because we are back to this situation. So I'm just going to skip ahead uh, and see how this, if I can wrap this up quickly because I'm running out of time. Okay. I'm going to steal five more minutes. Um, I want to see why, how we can bring that into the present. All right, so the great Stephen Anden actually around 2013 declared that the kind of anti-racist struggle as we knew it was over, that the new coordinates of global capitalism and neoliberalism had, had changed things and we needed a new, we needed to create something new. I don't disagree with him, but I think there's parts of our history that actually we could do with recovering in order to deal with these new coordinates of things today. And I'm going to go through those three things, like political blackness, uh, anti-imperialism, and the white working class, just really quickly. And don't worry, I'll share these slides with people if you all want to make notes. OK, so political blackness is much maligned. So kind of the most famous critiques come from Tariq Madud in the early 90s, saying that South Asians are silenced by this terminology. My friend who's speaking here later today, Kindy Andrews, has written about uh, the idea that uh, political blackness is anti anti ethnic black in the diaspora doesn't doesn't recognize that and is methodologically nationalist as you can see we kind of disagree on that um, but I say this is not the complete history the complete history of political blackness is how do we create forms of solidarity in reaction to a global system that depends on ideas of race and racialization the system we live in needs to racialize in order to to, to go forwards it's constantly doing that Right? And how do we create forms of solidarity? So we don't have to call ourselves politically black, but we need to understand that that is what political blackness was trying to do. And you need that when you get hilarious things like Brexit, right? 
So Brexit shows us a kind of old colonial racism where you stick brown people and their religion on, on, on uh, posters to scare the Jesus out of white people in the UK. And it worked. But also that in stigmatizing Eastern Europeans and other forms of white people, that the politics of whiteness means that we have to show how these things are linked together. And I think political blackness, its history actually does that for us. Anti-imperialism, ascent. Anti-racism in this country has tended now to become what we call methodologically nationalist. All that means is, is that it focuses within the problem of the nation state. So we've had lots of debates about why is my curriculum white? Why aren't we having more non-white people at Oxford and Cambridge? These are all wonderful things, but in a sense, they have to be joined up to a global politics in order for them to make sense. Because otherwise, us having black and brown faces in high places doesn't really change that much. Does that make sense? So all go ahead to these wonderful high places, but please let's help destroy them <laughs> so we can change things. And this links us back to that old history of British black power about what class means as a concept. It's not just about Britain, it's about the global context. So when you hear stupid ideas like global Britain or ideas of Lexit, we have to really, really be kind of wary of what that means. Because the world is still largely distributed wealth-wise the other way. I think Luke is going to use his later, so I'll skip this. Um, and finally, the white working class, which has come back with a, with a vengeance, right? You guys have been hearing about the white working class and their, their problematic dealing things. They're the ones who push Brexit forward, even though when we look at all the voting records, it was white middle class people with pensions and mortgages that voted Brexit through, right? The warning of British black power is that actually we can't fall for this nonsense debates about just re-articulating Britain. We have to be at the forefront of pushing forward real change that really affects all members of the working class. There is no such thing as the white working class. It doesn't exist. There are white members of the working class, right? And there are brown, black, and every other color of the working class. As we see, if we, if we do fall for that, <laughs> we end up with bizarre politics like this, right? But in our UK context, it's actually Paulism. And this is this idea that there is a constituency of people who suffer when non-white people or others turn up. And again, we know that that's not true. And I think we'll bring it to it. I'm just going to, this is a lovely quote from a Black Defense Committee pamphlet in 1971. And it says, cuts in social welfare and tax concessions to the rich, racialist laws at home and support for white supremacy abroad, all are part of the Tories' repressive strategy to crush the working class and divide it so that it's incapable of presenting a united front against Tory policies. The immigration bill is an attempt to divide trade unionists on race lines and isolate a scapegoat for the present. This was written in 1971. I could, I could essentially tweak this a little, and you'd think I was talking about 2018. So in many ways, our history is our future. I'll leave it there, because we run out of time. Hmm? It's...